So bots, okay, Toby Thorne, as you probably read from the beginning. Okay, so just some little notes here. He caught his first bat at age 11, and he just kept studying, went to Oxford. He then came to Canada and worked under Dr. Brock Fenton. And if a um, number you might've heard of Brock Fenton, he's probably one of the premier bat people in Canada, if not in other areas as well, probably in North America, maybe further, I'm not sure, but he's quite well known. And he stayed in Ontario once he finished his master's and he's working on a variety of programs and he's working on the bat conservation at Toronto Zoo. So it should be a very interesting talk. Okay, so I'm gonna unshare my screen and Toby, it's all yours. Okay, uh, yeah, well, good evening everyone. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, yeah, just give a shout if, if I'm not coming through clearly and I will get my screen sharing and we'll get going. Okay, is that, uh, well, hopefully that, that's coming through correctly. Um, I guess I'll sort of expect to shout if I'm sharing the wrong thing. Um, okay, excellent, thank you. Um, cool, so yeah, it's, hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you, for, thank you very much for having me along uh, tonight to talk about bats. Um, yeah, yeah, so as, as mentioned, I work at the zoo on our, our native bat conservation program. And so what I was going to do is start a bit broad with the, the broader context of bats and then narrow into bats in the province and, and what's going on with bats in Ontario, uh, what we're doing with them and then uh, things that you, you guys might be able to get involved with and, uh, and help out bats in Ontario. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so I've done a few Zoom presentations now, I'm still getting, uh, still kind of getting myself comfortable with, with presenting to a screen and not being able to see everyone and it's sort of interesting. Um, realizing how much you do rely on the audience so um, to kind of gauge how things are going. So it's, it's strange for me, I won't be able to hear you laughing at all my jokes, but I'll try and leave an appropriate gap. And similarly, uh, if I'm boring you, I won't be able to tell if you fall asleep. So feel free to do that at your leisure. Uh, but otherwise, I'll crack on. So I'd like to start talks here. Uh, which is not a particularly great uh, illustration to use in talks because it's really small. The text around the edges is illegible. And it's hard to make out what's going on. Um, but it, it kind of serves to make the point anyway. Uh, so what this is, is a family tree uh, for all the bats in the world. Uh, and so we start uh, in the middle here uh, with the last common ancestor to all of our modern bats. Uh, and then we get speciation where this one species splits into two, two to four, four to eight, and they keep splitting. Uh, and we end up uh, around the edge of the circle, the kind of outskirts of the tree here, uh, with all the bats that we have around the world today, uh, of which there are uh, a little over 1,400, 1,400. Uh, so that uh, accounts for almost one in four mammal species. So bats are actually an incredibly diverse group uh, they occur on every continent of the world except for Antarctica, uh, and they do an awful lot of different things. Uh, one space where we see diversity in bats is just in their, their size. So on the left, we have the golden crowned flying fox from Thailand, the biggest bat in the world. Uh, has a wingspan of about 5 feet 11 inches tall, uh, 11 inches, and if, I were, if we were doing this in person, I would now point out that I am 5 feet 11 inches tall, which is, is usually a, a useful metric, but doesn't help here. Uh, and on the right, we have the smallest bat in the world, Kitty's hog-nosed bat, uh, also found in Thailand. Um, and as you can see, it is, it's really titchy. And I'm not tricking you, that's not a baby, that's a fully grown adult, its babies are, are even smaller. Uh, so that's also sometimes known as the bumblebee bat, uh, due to its size and it can fit comfortably into a thimble. Um, <clears throat> there's also a lot of diversity in what bats eat. So uh, this is a brown long-eared bat, it's a bat uh, they filmed back in England uh, before I moved to Canada and we were rather uh, mean and tied this moth to a string as you can just make out and you can see this bat coming in. Uh, and this is illustrating one of the common, or the, the most common food group for bats which is uh, insects, so the, the, largest, the largest group of uh, diet, diet in bats is uh, insectivores. Uh, then we have frugivores, so this is another common group. Um, so this, is a, this particular bat is a Jamaican fruit bat, 
Uh, and as you can guess, it, it lives in Jamaica and, and around that part of the world uh, and eats fruit. Uh, and in uh, temperate countries where the, the, the weather is warmer and there's fruit available year round, uh, frugivory is a, a pretty common um, diet for bats. And getting a little bit less common, uh, there's a, a group of bats that are nectivores, so very sim filling a very similar ecological niche to hummingbirds. Uh, these bats uh, feed on the nectar in flowers, uh, and they also serve then to, um, uh, to pollinate plants. Uh, and it's interesting to compare bats that are pollinated, uh, sorry, compare plants that are pollinated by bats and uh, to those pollinated by birds and insects. Uh, plants pollinated by bats tend to be uh, less colorful because the bats aren't finding them by sight and by color. Uh, and we'll come on to that later. Uh, but they tend to have quite distinct shapes which help the bats to find them in the dark. Uh, and there's about 500 plants around the world that rely on bats for pollination. Uh, and there's some things that you might come across in your daily life that come from plants pollinated by bats. Uh, some, uh, some chocolate comes from plants pollinated by bats, some coffee, uh, but the main one that always springs to mind is tequila, which comes from the agave plant and is exclusively pollinated by bats. Uh, so if anyone's a fan of tequila and uh, you're sort of finding yourself with those uh, headachey mornings the day after, and uh, you have bats to blame for that, uh, but it is worth looking out for bat-friendly tequila, which is a, a growing uh, movement uh, of working with farmers to uh, grow sustainable crops uh, in a way that's bat-friendly and uh, effective for the farmers. Um, getting even rarer, there are a handful of fishing bats, uh, which, uh, as this picture illustrates, fly along over the water. They have enormous feet uh, relative to their size. Uh, and they, uh, they detect the ripples and find fish under the water and scoop them out with their feet so that they can eat as they're going along. Uh, this is the, one of the most famous fishing bats. It's the greater bulldog-faced bat. It's not a particularly strong looker. Uh, I was lucky enough to catch this on an expedition a few years ago to Belize. Uh, we strung a mist net over the water and caught a greater, uh, greater bulldog-faced bat. Uh, and we thought it'd be, it was a pretty rare one, so we thought it'd be a good one to take back and show to the rest of the group on the expedition. So one of my colleagues tried to put it in a bag and had a lot of trouble getting this bat into the bag because its long legs and long feet were reaching up his shirt and trying to climb out. Uh, and he eventually got it in there and we hung it up on the, the railing of the boat for the rest of the evening. Um, and then as we, as we packed up to go home, we found that this bat in particular had reached up, uh, reached up untied the bag and released itself sometime earlier. Uh, so no one else got to see that particular individual. Um, then we have uh, other carnivorous bats. So um, this is a, it's a dietary group uh, where they're eating uh, other vertebrate animals. So things like uh, rep small reptiles, frogs, uh, mammals, even, other, even including other bats. Uh, this picture in particular is of uh, Trachopsirosis, the uh, uh, fringe-lipped bat. Uh, and this bat uh, at least for part of the year, uh, uses fro has frogs as a large part of its diet. So these little frogs sit in jungle pools, in, this is in Central America, uh, and the males call for females, and sometimes they, they get uh, lucky and they find a female, but sometimes they get unlucky and they're eaten by a bat which swoops down uh, having pinpointed them uh, and eats them. And it, this is really interesting because bats aren't good carnivores. They're, um, uh, their teeth are evolved for eating insects uh, for the most part, uh, and then they've just got big and ambitious, but they're trying to chew through a, a, you know, something like a frog uh, with the wrong set of equipment. Um, so it takes a bat like this a long time to, to eat its food, um, but then the trade-off to that is that they then get enough um, uh, nutrition from that that they don't probably need to hunt for the rest of the night. Um, and finally, and perhaps most famously, there are vampire bats, of course. And uh, there's no vampire bats in Ontario, if anyone's concerned. Um, there's only three species that are true vampires. So of all those 1,400 different bats around the world, only three of them are true sanguivores. Uh, and they all live in Central America. Uh, two of them uh, specialize on birds, jungle fowl. And one of them, the, this bat here, the common vampire bat, uh, feeds on mammal blood. So in, in the past, that would have been uh, yeah, mammals living in the jungle and in modern times they, they frequently feed on cattle as well because we keep cutting down the jungle and replacing it with cattle ranches. Um, and vampire bats are, uh, I mean, they, they have a, a bad reputation, but they're actually pretty fascinating animals. Um, 
they so when they feed they actually are quite adept at running on the ground and they land on the ground and, and run along um, so that they can sneak up on animals without uh, uh, spooking them as if they were as they were flying up uh, and then they uh, they climb onto the animal they find a spot where the blood is close to the surface and that's why they have this weird looking face uh, they have a lot of heat sensors there to detect warm uh, warm skin where the blood is close to the surface uh, and they take a divot of skin with those two front incisors. So you can see the, in the center of the bat's mouth, the two front teeth there. Uh, those are incredibly sharp and um, uh, like scalpel blades. And so the bat takes out a small divot of skin uh, and then uh, it licks, um, yeah, licks the blood up. Uh, and so if anyone uh, sort of particularly doesn't like the side of blood, then you might want to just, uh, look away for this next slide. But this is a, a vampire bat, uh, yeah, drinking from a, an animal. I think they look very much like kittens. Uh, it's just a different color. Uh, but it's actually quite fascinating because um, the bat wants to drink and it needs a substantial uh, meal of blood in order to, um, uh, in order to sustain itself. Uh, but when we get cuts and scrapes, we don't want all our blood to fall out. That would be very inconvenient. So our body has a mechanism to stop that. Uh, so we, a scab forms, the blood clots, and it seals up the hole. Uh, but that's not to the bat's advantage. So they have in their saliva uh, a chemical which prevents the blood from clotting, um, which means the bat can keep drinking, and it means if you get bitten by a vampire bat, uh, you bleed for a very long time. And I can attest to that because uh, I have a special relationship with the bat in this picture. Uh, in that this was one of the um, this was a vampire bat that I caught on the first night that I spent uh, catching bats in the tropics, uh, and it's also a bat that bit me, um, and which we try and avoid. But there were, to be fair, there were seven vampires in the net, and it was only the seventh one that bit me. Um, and it is not a good animal to be bitten by because there is a fairly high rabies risk with vampire bats. Uh, but I was fortunate uh, to have, well, I, I wasn't fortunate, I'd planned ahead and I had, a vac uh, had my rabies vaccination and I got post-exposure treatment. Um, but aside from the rabies risk, uh, they're quite a cool animal to be bitten by uh, because as I mentioned, those teeth are so sharp, you don't feel it. Uh, and then the saliva, uh, it prevents the blood from clotting and so you keep bleeding for a long time, which is quite inconvenient. Um, uh, but it felt like a fair trade that I, I got to take this picture uh, and the bat uh, got, a, got to take a swipe at me. Um, okay, so that's kind of my spiel about the diversity of bats. Uh, and there's, there's a lot more that we could dig into there, but I don't want to spend the whole evening talking uh, just on that. Um, so what I'll move on to now is what, uh, what is common among bats. So what makes a bat a bat? Uh, and so um, you should be able to see this video here. This is a slow motion video. It's about uh, played back about uh, 1 20th of the speed of real time. Uh, and this is a greater horseshoe bat uh, that we caught for a study and you can see he was looking around the environment, um, taking a good look, uh, and then stretches out his wings and flies away. Uh, and of course this is illustrating uh, the common feature among all bats and the thing that makes them bats, which is uh, that they are the only flying mammal. Um, and you, so you might have heard of other mammals with flight, so there's the flying squirrel, uh, flying lemur, things like that. Uh, but of course, those animals don't have true flight. Uh, they're, they're gliding, they're falling slowly, but they don't have uh, true powered flight. Uh, they can't go up. Uh, they can't move about completely in 3D space as a bat can. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so this is, is common across all bats. Um, and it uh, opens up a, a vast ecological world to them uh, where they can exploit a lot of different niches that would otherwise be unavailable. Uh, so, for example, for insectivorous bats, it allows them to catch flying insects uh, that, that otherwise they wouldn't be able to get to. Uh, similarly, even for fruit-eating bats, it opens up a lot of opportunities. If you picture, uh, it, or if you imagine a mammal that can't fly, that feeds on fruit uh, in trees, to go from one tree to the next has to climb down, run along the ground, climb up the next tree has to find that tree. Um, and that's very difficult and it makes the animal vulnerable. Uh, whereas a bat, it, once it's finished feeding in one tree, can just up and fly to the next a lot more easily. Um, but flight is, is rare. Uh, it only is only evolved in three groups of uh, vertebrate animals, so those with an internal skeleton. Uh, originally in pterosaurs back around the time of the dinosaurs, 
um, in birds, uh, and then most you know, best of all in bats. Um, and it's interesting to compare the bat and the bird uh, and look at the wing there. And you can see that although they, they achieve uh, approximately the same function, they, they do it in quite a different way where the bird's wing uh, has a reduction of many of the bones, most of the finger bones are lost. Uh, and the, the greater part of the, the wing structure is provided by the feathers which extend down from that arm. Uh, as in contrast, the bat uh, has gone the other way and is, instead of losing fingers, they've got bigger. Uh, and the structure of the wing is made up of a tissue membrane, uh, which is then stretched between the, uh, the extended fingers. Um, and there's pros and cons to those two different approaches. Um, there's some advantages to the, the bat's approach is that it, uh, because that's living tissue, they can have sensory cells there. Uh, so in, the, in a bat's, if you look very closely at a bat's wing, there are very fine hairs on the surface, uh, which detects the air flowing over the wing and allow the bat to find it. And then there's tendons and um, yeah, tendons and ligaments in the wing that allow them to very finely adjust the shape of their, their aerofoil while they're flying uh, based on that sensory feedback. Uh, there was a neat study a few, a few years ago now where researchers used a hair removal cream to temporarily and harmlessly remove the hair from the wings of a group of, uh, of bats. Uh, and then tested their uh, ability to fly through a maze and they got a lot clumsier and less maneuverable without those hairs. Um, the trade-off is, is, is that it's is living tissue, it's harder to replace, um, it's less, bats don't tend to be as optimized for gliding and things like that. Um, and if looking at the, that diagram there, if looking at the bat's wing looks familiar to you, it should because those are uh, exactly the same bones that we have in our human arm, just with slightly different proportions. And so. Um, <laughs> As I always think it's appropriate to say that bats fly by the power of jazz hands. Uh, although I suppose the, the Latin would, um, they didn't, uh, you know, when they named them in, in the Latin for the scientific name, they didn't go that way. Uh, they went with corruptor, which means hand wing, which is, is close to jazz hands. Um, and so I, I talked about how flight opens up a lot of opportunities for bats. It also comes at a cost, and, and that's the reason why there aren't more uh, or more flying animals. Um, and the, the cost is that it takes a huge amount of energy to get off the ground and get into the air. Uh, and that really impacts every aspect of a bat's biology. Um, I don't have a, a slide of a bat's skeleton in this talk, but if you look at a bat's skeleton, uh, you can see how incredibly fine the bones are, how, um, uh, yeah, so how minimal they are. And that works for a bat, but it's not so good for things like walking around. So they really compromise on, on that mobility uh, on the ground. Um, it also factors very much into a bat's reproduction. Uh, and so the uh, bats being mammals, they have to carry their young internally to a fairly, uh, to a fairly long, uh, late stage, uh, which is in, in stark contrast to birds who can offload that uh, pretty early by laying eggs. Uh, and that restricts most bats to having uh, only one offspring a year. In the case of some of the larger bats, they have twins. Um, and so it, it limits the bat's ability to, uh, to reproduce and to, to maintain their population. Uh, and this is a picture I took in, uh, in, again in England some years ago. This is a brown long-eared bat. You can see the, her face here, uh, the ears are up here. Um, it, it's brown long-eared, so it has very large ears. Uh, and then this sort of lump up here uh, hanging off is the baby. Uh, and normally we would avoid handling bats at this period. Um, we don't, when they're very pregnant or when they have young attached. Uh, unfortunately, we've got the timing slightly wrong this year. So we, um, yeah, so we pulled this bat out of a box and we, we found this and took a quick picture and, and let her on her way. Um, but you can see the size of the baby compared to the mother there. Um, and so the females, yeah, they have to carry that while they're pregnant. And then they, they also carry the, the baby between roosts. Um, if they need to move it while, they're, while it's growing. And um, yeah, so it's, it's a huge burden on bats. And the fact that they breed so slowly, as I say, producing only one offspring a year in most cases, uh, makes them particularly vulnerable to, to population loss and, and decline and that sort of thing. Um, so moving on, I, I showed the video of the bat flying uh, a few slides ago. And uh, one thing to note about that was it was filmed with an infrared camera. So that was actually in complete darkness. Uh, and that's the other really impressive thing that bats do, uh, which is that they, they operate at night in, in darkness. Um, and so, and that's pretty alien to us as humans, we're, we're pretty light-based. 
And so here is a picture that I took in the forest one night. Um, and I think you'd all be pretty hard pressed if I asked you to run through here uh, and avoid all the trees. Um, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, and I think if I asked you then to go catch some moths or some, uh, you know, some other flying bugs, you'd find that even more difficult. Uh, but of course, to a bat, that's no particular barrier. Uh, and we can often uh, I can often recognize nocturnal animals uh, because they, they're adapted with uh, large eyes to gather light when not much is available. Um, and we see that in some bats, and particularly the flying foxes. So this is a flying fox, uh, and you can see it's got, you see where it gets the name. It has this dog-like face with big eyes, uh, small ears, and, and a big muzzle and a big nose. Uh, and so flying foxes, um, yeah, so they find their way in the dark just, just with big eyes, uh, as I said, gathers more light when not a lot's available. Uh, and they're all uh, fruit eaters and fruit doesn't run away. Uh, and they have a big nose so they can smell where they're going. Uh, and so that works pretty well for them. Um, but if we think about uh, insectivorous bats and that being the largest group of bats, um, however good your eyesight is, it's going to be pretty challenging to find, uh, to find an insect that's also moving in 3D space uh, and potentially trying to avoid you uh, and to find that in the dark and successfully intercept it. And so, of course, what the majority of bats do is not to use their eyesight, uh, although it's a myth that bats are blind, they can see quite well. Um, but they supplement that vision uh, with sound, uh, with echolocation. Uh, and so as the bats are flying along, they're shouting really loudly and they, they produce sound the same way that we do. They just do it at a higher frequency. Uh, and that sound travels out and it bounces off objects in the environment, like uh, trees that they don't want to bump into or something like this tasty moth that they do want to intercept. Uh, and the bat is able to uh, detect those, uh, those echoes, which are many times quieter than the sounds they're producing. And they have to have some uh, interesting mechanisms to facilitate detecting such quiet sounds while they're emitting such loud ones. Uh, and, and through this, the bats are able to, to build up a, an image of their environment and to successfully navigate through that. Um, and there's a couple of different ways in which they emit sound. Um, obviously, the most, most bats emit sound through their mouths. Uh, so I'd like to just talk about this picture where you can see this, this is a, a big brown bat flying along with his mouth open, its teeth showing, um, and it looks quite aggressive. Uh, and people in the, the bat world say we shouldn't use pictures like this because it makes bats look aggressive. And, and I don't, well, I do agree with that, but it, the problem with it is that this bat has its mouth open because it's looking where it's going. Um, and so if you try and take pictures of bats, they often have their mouths open. Even if you're holding it in your hand, it's got its mouth open because it's echolocating, trying to figure out what on earth is going on. Uh, so you can try and get pictures without that, but I, I think it's, we can't just exclude them and it's important to explain uh, what's going on. And so you see there's a, there are a handful of other pictures in my talk or that there's been one already that shows a bat that looks like this. Uh, and so when you, whenever you see that, it's really important to remember that the bat is just looking where he's going and he's not being aggressive. Uh, but some bats do it a bit differently. And instead of echolocating through their mouths, they've switched to echolocating through their noses. Uh, so this is a, a greater, another greater horseshoe bat. It's named the horseshoe bat for the flap of skin around its nose, uh, sort of roughly horseshoe shaped. You can see the big nostrils there. Um, there's a couple of advantages to nasal echolocation. One is that the bat can have a more focused cone of sound, uh, and that's what the skin flaps are there for as well. Uh, another advantage uh, is that it can fly with its mouth full, so it can catch an insect uh, and then fly off to eat it at its leisure and still, uh, still be looking where it's going uh, while it's carrying that in its mouth. Um, uh, the oral echolocators have to do a sort of backflip maneuver in midair so that they can eat. Uh, and then eat and clear their mouth in order to resume echolocation before they bump into something. Um, yeah, okay, and so I, I mentioned already, but uh, the sounds bats make uh, are not audible to humans. Um, generally, the bats start about 20 kilohertz and human hearing stops at about 20 kilohertz. If you're young and more so if you're female, you, your hearing may just go high enough that you can hear some of the very lowest frequency bats if you know what you're uh, listening to. Uh, but as we get older, we lose that top, uh, top range of our hearing. Uh, you lose about a kilohertz for every decade that you live and you can speed that up by going to rock concerts. Uh, so we, we quickly lose any ability to hear bats. So at that point, we have to start using technology to, uh, to hear where they are and what they're doing. 
so what I'm just going to play now is a very short video clip, and this is of, of uh, bats swarming. It's an activity they do late in the season where you see large groups of bats, and it has a soundtrack uh, of their echolocation. So you can see them and you can hear, uh, hear the sounds they're making as they fly through the screen. Um, and hopefully this works okay. I know um, videos don't always work brilliantly on Zoom, but we'll give it a try. Yeah, so hopefully that, that came through okay. Uh, and yeah, that's after, uh, I'm, I'm almost at 20 years of chasing bats. And even after all this time, it's still one of my favorite things to sit with a bat detector and, and hear them as I watch them and, and see the, 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 what they're up to up there. Um, okay, so at that point, this point, then I'd like to introduce you to the bats that we have in Ontario. So some of you may already be familiar, but I'll go through them. Uh, so there are eight different species of bat currently uh, officially in the province. There's, there's one that's kind of at the border, and I think it's just a matter of time until we find it here. But for right now, we'll have eight. Uh, and I've put them in two groups of four, this being the first. Uh, and these are the four, uh, four larger of the, the species that we have. Uh, and they're also uh, the four that are not currently considered to be at risk. However, uh, three of them, all of these, with the exception of the big brown, uh, are actually currently... Um, in the process for assessment at the federal level um, due to potential declines. Uh, so we might see those, those added to the, the species of risk lists uh, in the coming years too. Uh, but for now they're not, so we'll separate them this way. Uh, so we have on the upper left the big brown bat uh, and um, around Hamilton if any of you see, oh excuse me, if any of you see bats in your garden or if you're out in a park or you know, out for a stroll on a summer evening and you see bats um, in the Hamilton area, uh, I'd say I put you know reasonable money that it's a big brown bat that you're seeing. Uh, at this point, they are by far the most uh, commonly encountered and abundant uh, bats in southern Ontario, uh, and we we see them um, uh, in the monitoring that we do, sort of everywhere south of Lake Simcoe is, is pretty much, uh, and they're north of there as well. But certainly south of Lake Simcoe is just abundant big brown bats. Uh, and even uh, I did a bat walk last year uh, in downtown Toronto in Queen's Park. Uh, and within a few minutes of sunset, we were hearing, hearing big brown bats there. So even in urban areas, they're pretty common. Um, yeah, and they are a, uh, uh, they're also a bat which is happily, uh, happily roosts in buildings. So uh, they're a common species that people find roosting in their houses. Uh, again, sort of in southern Ontario. <clears throat> Um, they form large maternity colonies of up to one, you know, easily one or two hundred bats can be there uh, in, the, in the single maternity colony, um, which is why buildings are a good venue for them. Uh, and uh, yeah, and they're pretty sedentary. So they're, um, they're kind of just always around. Uh, in the wintertime, they hibernate. And as far as we know, they, they seem to hibernate pretty close to home. So in buildings and trees uh, close to where they spend the summer. Uh, and then the other three bats we have here uh, are often grouped together. So we have the eastern red bat, the hoary bat, the silver-haired bat. Uh, you often see these referred to as the tree bats, uh, and that's because of their habit of roosting on the outsides of trees. So you can see um, in these pictures, the red and the hoary are hanging from branches, um, the silver-haired sitting on bark. And that's a pretty common scenario that these, these bats would, uh, would spend their time. Uh, they're different to big brown bats in that they, they're not cavity roosters. So big brown bats, they, if they were roosting in a tree, they would sort of go inside, they would look for a rotten tree and be sort of in the middle uh, and tucked up uh, sort of safely inside. Um, these other three hang out on the outside, so either sitting on the bark or hanging from the leaves, uh, which is why they're called tree bats, um, but I don't find it tremendously helpful because all of Ontario's bats roost in trees, uh, so it doesn't really differentiate them. Um, but this, uh, this habit does leave them more exposed and you can see that they all have quite long shaggy fur uh, and that's so they can keep themselves warm uh, when, they're in more, more, when they're more exposed. Um, the hoary and the red also differ from all the others in that they're, uh, they're solitary breeders. So whereas the other species form maternity colonies, um, which can be quite large and um, well, you know, from 20 individuals for some species up to hundreds for others. Uh, the red and the hoary are both solitary, so they, uh, they give birth by themselves um, and yeah, raise, the, raise the young themselves. Um, the other thing that links 
the, the three bats here, the, the Eastern Red, the Hoyer, and the Silver Hedges, they're all long distance migrants. So uh, come winter, when it gets very cold in Ontario, as we're heading into now, these bats, uh, these bats aren't, aren't dealing with that. So like some Canadians, they fly south for the winter. Uh, and so into the states, into the southern states, in the case of the Hori, probably even as far as Mexico. Um, and so they spend the winter down there uh, in sort of more favorable conditions and then return uh, come spring to breed up here. Uh, and so where we do, uh, we monitor bats throughout the year, we see some of these species peaking in the late summer where they're, they're, we're probably seeing individuals that are up north flying south. Um, and that's pretty impressive for animals of this size. And so the hoary bat is, is actually the largest bat that we have in Ontario. It weighs about 30 grams. So that's about the same as a double A battery. And I don't think we, I don't think humans have made a double A battery that can get all the way to Mexico yet. Um, so it's a pretty impressive movement for an animal of that size. Uh, so then our other four bats that we have in Ontario, um, the reason I've separated these out, well, so we have three myotis. Uh, myotis is a very uh, a widespread uh, genus of bats uh, that yeah, occurs, occurs quite commonly around the world. And we have three here, the little brown myotis, the myotis, the eastern small footed. Um, and they're all pretty similar looking small brown bats. Um, little brown myotis is kind of in the middle. Northern Meredith has got slightly longer ears uh, and the Eastern small footed have, is a bit smaller and has small feet. Um, but apart from that, they're kind of much of a muchness. Uh, and then we have the tricolored, uh, which stands out on its own. If, uh, if you have an older field guide or if you sort of read about bats in the past, uh, tricolored bat is, was formerly known as the Eastern Pipistrel uh, until we decided it wasn't a Pipistrel and it got renamed and it's in a, a genus by itself of uh, Paramyotis. Uh, and that one's a little bit easier to distinguish. It doesn't have the white belly that the others, that the other three here do. Uh, and it has, um, if you get a close look at its fur, it has three distinct bands of color along its fur. Um, it's also very rare in Ontario. Um, and the tricolored and the small footed were really just at the very northern extent of their range. So they just about extend into Ontario, uh, but we don't, uh, we don't see it. They don't go very far north and we don't see a lot of them. Uh, just to contradict myself there though, uh, Hamilton is probably actually a good space to be looking for the Eastern small footed myotis because where it does occur in Ontario, one of the main uh, places is it does follow the Niagara escarpment um, north. So they make them all the way, uh, they make it all the way to the, the top of the Bruce Peninsula, um, but just kind of following that ge geological feature they don't necessarily occur on either side of it. Um, and the reason I group these four together is that they are all uh, considered endangered in Ontario and all of them except the small footed uh, are also considered endangered uh, at federal level in Canada. Um, uh, yeah, and that, that's kind of, that's very concerning. Uh, and I'll talk about why these species are listed. Um, but the little brown is, is gone from probably being the most common species uh, a few years ago or well, maybe 10 or 15 years ago now to, to now being um, certainly not gone, but uh, hard to find uh, if you've sort of got to know where you're looking for it. Um, and the reason for the decline in these bats is centered around white nose syndrome. This is, is something you've probably heard of. Uh, it's a fungus that grows, um, it, it likes to grow in the caves uh, where the four bats on the previous slide all hibernate. So those ones are, uh, do hibernate in Ontario. And they might travel, you know, might travel a few hundred kilometers to find a cave, but then the, that's where they spend the winter. And unfortunately, this fungus likes the same conditions. Uh, and it, so it grows when the bats go in the cave, it grows on their bodies as well. Uh, it grows in their soft tissues, in their wings, as you can see in the, the picture on the right here. Uh, and it grows around their faces. So you can see these patches of white around the bat's nose on the left. Uh, and uh, I should say this, this sort of silvery sheen on the bat's back is actually water that has condensed because the bat in hibernation is so cold. Uh, that water condenses on it. So this, this on the back is normal, uh, but this white around the nose is not, and that's the sign of the fungus. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, white nose syndrome has a human uh, origin, and it exists in other countries, uh, other continents of the world, and the bats you know, exist in Europe, and the bats there uh, presumably have the opportunity to co-evolve with it and um, are able to deal with it. Bats in North America had never been exposed, and then some uh, human activity uh, moving between caves on different continents has brought the fungus to North America, uh, to a cave in uh, Albany, in New York State, uh, where it was first detected in 2006. And you can see uh, this map shows the spread 
over time with color showing uh, time. Uh, you can see how far the fungus has, has spread uh, since 2006. And in fact, this map's a little bit out of date. This is the most recent. So we, we even in the past year, we add more, um, yeah, add more states and a new province to that list. Uh, and um, yeah, and so the white nose has caused a, a huge decline in the bats that we see here. It reached Ontario, it was first detected in Ontario in 2010. Um, and we, we, part of the problem with bats is that we weren't paying that much attention to them before this, this disaster happened. So we don't have a ton of uh, pre-white nose data always to go on. Um, but where we do see data in, in Canada is, to my mind, is, is encapsulated very well by this um, uh, highlight of the little brown bat in the 2017 Living Planet report produced by uh, World Wildlife Fund Canada. Uh, and I'll draw your attention to this quote. Uh, so within three years of discovery, white nose syndrome had wiped out 94% of hibernating little brown bats in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Ontario, and Quebec. Uh, and some ecologists have called this uh, the most rapid decline of mammals ever documented. Uh, which is someone who loves bats and has studied bats for almost 20 years is, is not something that I, I want to read about, uh, or about any group of wildlife, to be fair, but uh, especially about the one that I'm, uh, I'm focused on. Uh, and so, um, yeah, and it's a really concerning problem. Uh, and there are various efforts going on to try and ameliorate the impact of white nose syndrome and try and uh, reduce that. Uh, but the truth is that there's not a whole lot we can do about it. There are, we can treat bats for it, but it really involves taking them into captivity. Uh, it's very hard to effectively um, implement that. Well, it's impossible to implement that for every uh, cave in North America to treat this. If we started going in and spraying fungicides, we, we take out the fungus that should be there as well. Uh, so it's difficult to really address at scale. Uh, the one kind of um, glimmer of hope here is the fact that the bat, bats have been exposed to this for a long time, you know, since uh, 14 years in New York State, 10 years in Ontario now. Uh, and they've declined, but they certainly haven't disappeared. Uh, and so we, we, there's far fewer of the species that are affected, but uh, they are still out there and we're starting to, to talk about the idea that we're seeing uh, resistance, genetic resistance in the populations. Um, and so some of them might be able to weather this storm, but at that point the, the conversation has to shift to how do we, um, how do we maintain the much smaller populations that we have effectively uh, and how do we provide uh, space and support, uh, support them recovering. Um, and I, I certainly don't think, you know, hopefully, um, something like little brown bat will survive in Ontario, but I don't think that we will see uh, the pre-white nose numbers returning probably in my lifetime, no matter what we do. So it's, it's a bit of a, a challenging, uh, challenging one, but it, it has brought a lot of, the silver lining is it's brought a lot of attention and uh, focus to the conservation of bats. Uh, one other conservation matter I want to mention very briefly for bats is wind turbines. Um, and so, and there's sort of an irony here that the four, the four bats that hibernate in Ontario in, in caves and are affected by white nose aren't particularly affected by wind turbines. Uh, but the three long distance migrants that aren't affected by white nose syndrome because they don't go into caves uh, are uh, the ones that are most affected by wind turbines. So we have two distinct threats which neatly uh, defect two distinct groups of bats. It's almost as if we planned it. Um, but And wind turbines is, is tricky because as a, an environmentalist, I, I definitely believe in the need for a sustainable power, um, but they are uh, problematic whether they cause uh, large amounts, they can cause large fatalities in, in migratory bats in particular. Um, the story of wind turbines is a little bit more positive than white nose syndrome uh, in that there is more that we can do to reduce that impact. Uh, and this is things like um, changing the parameters at which the turbines operate at to avoid the overlap with bats. Um, bats don't migrate if it's too windy, turbines don't make money if it's not windy enough, and if you slightly um, change the cut-in threshold at which the turbine starts to operate, you can greatly reduce the impact on bats. And uh, that's, that's very simplistic, but they're, they're actually doing a lot of really complex um, stuff and sort of trying to find the optimal solution for both parties. Uh, and the, the wind industry has been fairly uh, forward-thinking and um, uh, enthusiastic about doing that. If I, if I were cynical, I'd say it's because they're trying to avoid having more regulation, um, but in any case, it sort of seems to be uh, making progress there. Uh, so at which point I'll move on to talking about what we do at the Toronto Zoo to, to help bats in Ontario. Uh, and a large part of what we do is just monitoring, uh, well, it is monitoring, and I like to think of it as the natural history of bats, 
uh, and trying to fill the knowledge gaps about bats in the province. Because one of the problems we face, in fact, probably one of the biggest problems that we face or that, that faces the conservation of bats, apart from the threats that faces them, is that we don't have a, a great picture of what's out there with bats. We don't know what's going on. We don't know the answer to many questions about their ecology. So we have to start with the basics and collecting those observations, and then we can build that into, into more detailed research uh, and asking specific questions. Uh, and one of our first steps to understanding bats is often just going out uh, and recording them. And we do a lot of our recording using acoustic monitoring. So on this tree here, uh, we have this box of electronics, which is an, um, capable of recording the, the ultrasound the bats make uh, from this microphone up here. Uh, and this one's automated. This is another example. Um, and so we can leave these out um, for months at a time. Uh, they turn on in the evening. They listen out. If a bat flies by, they record it. Uh, in the morning, they, they go to sleep and they wait till, uh, till dark again. Uh, and with this, we can collect, um, yeah, we can collect large amounts of, of data about what bats are doing. We, we can collect these acoustics uh, with sort of handheld devices as well, uh, but we do a lot of it with this, these automated approaches that record all night, every night, and then we can uh, record them all summer with just the occasional visit to change batteries and, and collect data. Um, and what we get from this is, 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 is recordings of the bat sound, uh, which we then analyze to identify species. Um, and I just wanted to show you a little bit of that process. So I'll show two species here. So what, what we have in the, this is a, a picture of a big brown bat in the front, and behind it is a spectrogram of the sound that it's producing. And so when we analyze sound, we actually tend to, we spend much more time looking at it than we do listening to it. Uh, and that's because it makes it easier to, to tell the species apart. So um, on this plot here, along time, we have, uh, sorry, along the x-axis, we have time. Along the y-axis, we have frequency, and it's a little bit hard to make out, but uh, right at this level is 20 kilohertz, uh, which is, as I mentioned before, the upper range of human hearing. Uh, this bat is sort of starting up around 65 or, or more kilohertz, and then dropping down to about 25. Uh, so it sweeps through quite a large range. Uh, and that, combined with a few other factors, tells me that this is a big brown bat. Uh, and um, you're trying to sort of keep that picture in your mind, and we'll, we'll compare that to a different species on the next slide. But first, I'd just like to play it back for you. Uh, so this is a, uh, first of all, this is a live approximation of if we could hear the bats, the bats ultrasound. So you can hear the rapid series of clicks there. Uh, but what's even neater, another way of reducing the sound so that we can hear it is to play it back slower. So if we play the sound back 10 times slower, it uh, reduces the frequency by a factor of 10 and it drops that sort of uh, you know, 30 kilohertz sound down to three and we can hear it. So I'll play that. Uh, and people often compare those sounds to birds. Um, and so we, and then moving on, we have the eastern red bat. Uh, as you can see, if, we, if you focus over here on this part of the spectrogram, you can see the call shape is quite different. It has a smaller frequency range. It's slightly higher in frequency, and it has this more kind of uh, L shape to it rather than the, the longer sweep in the previous species. Uh, and then what we also have is, is this section here. You'll tell is, it looks different. Uh, and what that feature is, is the bat shifting its echolocation as it closes in on its prey. So we call this a feeding buzz. As the bat gets closer to its uh, prey, it has to update its position faster. It has to make calls that are shorter uh, and closer together. And it ends up sounding like a buzz. Uh, so I'll play that in real time. So hopefully you can hear that buzz there, kind of rough. It sounds like the bat is blowing a raspberry. Uh, and then this is the, the neatest one to play slowed down. Cool. So hopefully that, that came through clearly for all of you. And, and you can hear there just at, towards the end where the, uh, at the feeding buzz, how close together those sounds get. Uh, and remember the bat is doing that 10 times faster. So it's sort of quite an insight into the, uh, how impressive they can be. Um, yeah, so a large part of the work is having collected the data is then analyzing it, identifying species. And then we can do the fun part of, of figuring out what it's telling us. Um, so this is a, a plot showing uh, data from a number of recorders around the around, uh, sort of northern half of Toronto, east and west. And you can see here, 
uh, well, what this shows is the size of the circle uh, is demonstrating the, um, uh, yeah, the number of calls uh, recorded in, in June and July, or the average nightly activity in June and July, and then the colors represent the species, and this is just for the three motus bats. Uh, and it's, it, what you can take away from this is that although we're seeing variation in the amount of activity and there's a few hot spots, um, we're seeing little brown motus in the blue pretty much everywhere. Uh, we're seeing um, eastern small-footed motus, which is yellow, uh, on just on the west side, and that's really at sites that are associated with the Niagara escarpment. And then northern motus we're picking up on the west, uh, sorry, on the east side. Uh, never heard that in the, in the west so far. Uh, and that seems to be limited to a different area. So we're, we're starting to pick apart the, the different geographies of where we're finding these species. Um, just a, another quick look at what we can do with acoustic data is we can look at how activity varies over the course of the year. Uh, so if we look here in this upper graph, we have a month of night, uh, average, sorry, average nightly activity for big brown bat broken down by month uh, at one survey site. And you can see the peak activity is really June and July when they're giving birth. Um, July would be when the young are starting to take flight. Uh, August, the bats are trying to, still trying to gain weight for the winter. And then as it gets, we get into the colder months, activity drops off. Um, but things look a bit different for the silver-haired bat, uh, where we sort of get some base level of activity in, in June and July when there's, there's probably some individuals breeding. Uh, but we, saw, we see more activity in August and September. And I mentioned that this is a migratory species. Uh, and so this is a bat that we tend to see um, increased activity of in the fall or in the late summer and the fall where they're traveling south uh, on their way to find warmer climates ahead of the winter. Uh, so acoustics can tell us a lot, um, and it's, it's certainly a very fun way to learn about bats, but there's only so much we can learn from acoustics, and we can't hear how healthy a bat is. Uh, sometimes it's hard to tell the species apart acoustically. Uh, we can't hear if it's breeding, if it's young or old, etc. So at some point we have to get our hands on them. Uh, so we do go out bat catching as well. Uh, I should note that we're all rabies vaccinated and, and trained in doing this, and uh, it does require permits. Um, but once we, yeah, once we catch the bats, we're able to record uh, a sort of suite of basic biometrics about them uh, and then sort of gain the greater insight into what they're doing in the area. Uh, and we can go a bit further as well. Um, one particularly exciting example we had was uh, it was catching northern motors. So a couple of slides I showed that we acoustically had been recording northern motors in the east end of the city and around Rouge Park. Uh, and then we supplemented that. Uh, with trapping and so going out and catching bats uh, and um, yeah this, this is really exciting it's, we're pretty much the only place where anyone's able to catch northern motus in Ontario right now no, no one else seems to be able to find them uh, I don't know what they're you know and then we, they turn up not only in the city but on the doorstep of the zoo uh, which even for me is an extraordinary piece of luck um, and so we've been uh, yeah beyond catching we've been going a bit further with these bats you can see um, these bats well it's actually the same bat just different photographs uh, but you can see he has a band on the wing uh, and this is applying that uh, and similar very obviously very similar to bird banding we apply a band with a unique number and that allows us to uh, identify the bat once uh, if we recapture it um, and we, this is something we started doing in the past couple of years. We weren't able to do this year because we couldn't uh, handle bats due to COVID. Um, but we're hoping as we continue to survey the same spot, we'll, we'll start to get more recaptures and learn about the population that way. Uh, we've also used tools like radio telemetry uh, to, to study the bats and look where they're going. Uh, now, if any of you have been involved in radio telemetry, a good rule of thumb or a wide, widely used rule of thumb is that you don't want a transmitter to weigh more than 5% of the animal's body weight. Uh, and so our bats are tiny, so we have to use tiny transmitters to stick with that rule. Uh, this transmitter here weighs about 0.29 grams, which brings it into safe use for this bat. Uh, you can see here gluing it to the back. Uh, and we can then let the bats go and then uh, follow them. Uh, the problem with, with radio tracking these bats is that because the transmitters are so small, they're very weak. And so at best, we might get two kilometers range, but realistically, it can just be a few hundred meters. Uh, so we have uh, you end up spending a lot of time uh, hiking around the forest at night, trying to stay within range of these bats to, to understand where it is they're going. Uh, but using this, we're able, we're able to identify roosts, and we've also been able to identify uh, foraging areas. So these uh, on this map, this, this plot, the... Uh, the colors represent foraging areas of four different bats that we tracked in 2019. 
Uh, you can see the three of them, uh, bats one, three, and four, all went south and foraged uh, along the river in this meadow area at this location. And one of them, to be contrary, bat two went north and foraged on a different river in a different meadow at the other end of the, the site. Uh, and so this was this was pretty neat, and um, yeah, and something that we're well, we have some big plans to, to try and improve our, our telemetry data here. Uh, but it sort of it shows uh, yeah, kind of where, where the bats are up to. Um, and so yeah, and I, with this, I, I, I wanted to acknowledge that we certainly aren't doing this work on our own. Um, we're, we're lucky to have the, the opportunity to work on this this conservation program at the zoo and to have the, the space in the Toronto Zoo to do it. Uh, but it, it's um, it certainly required uh, a lot of partnerships and uh, funding to to make it happen. So it sort of uh, some of the work I've talked about we've, we've done with Parks Canada, York Region, TRCA, uh, Georgina Island First Nation, and NCC, um, with federal and provincial funding from Ontario, and even got some funding from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which I think is, is pretty good with the current administration. Um, yeah, and uh, so. Um, uh, with that, I, I wanted to finish up by talking about things that you uh, you all might be able to to get involved in if you're, if you're interested to learn more about bats or to help bats. Um, the place to start here is bat houses. Uh, so bat houses, if, if you're good at carpentry or you know someone who is, is an easy thing to knock together uh, and put up uh, in your garden or your cottage uh, and see if bats use it. Um, uh, it's a bat houses can be quite hit or miss. Uh, they tend to work best where there are already bats, and so they're not necessarily adding habitat. They're, well, the bats are already there; they already have a place to roost. But they might you might be providing them with an additional option. Um, if they don't work, if it, if it doesn't work, if you don't get bats, you're still providing uh, habitat for spiders and uh, bugs and creepy crawlies, regardless. So you're still helping something out. Um, if you're interested in bat houses, we have. Um, on our bats page at Toronto Zoo, so torontozoo.com slash bats. Uh, you can download a PDF guide which has um, plans for, for building two, uh, two designs of bat houses, including the one you can see here, uh, and instructions on putting those up. Uh, oh, there's an arrow, which is hopefully not needed, but that, that's where our bat house is. And if you ever visit the zoo, um, once we reopen, uh, and you're familiar with this site and the America's Pavilion, you, you can see this uh, for yourself up close and personal. Um, second point here, uh, we really encourage people to get involved in Neighbourhood Bat Watch. Uh, the zoo is a, a partner on this for Southern Ontario, but it, it's a multi-province, multi-organisation uh, multi project. It started in Quebec, as you might be able to guess from the number of uh, reports in Quebec, and Ontario is sadly lacking. We, we've got a ways to go to catch up. Um, but the, so what, what this project is really about is encouraging people to report bat roosts. And so as a bat biologist, finding the roost, finding where the bats are living is one of the hardest parts. We often have to do it by radio tracking. Um, but realistically, if people have bats in their house or their barn or their cottage, they tend to know about it. Uh, and so this is a, an opportunity for people to, to let us know. And so you can report your, your bats on here. Uh, and that gives... Uh, means that bat researchers uh, can get in touch with you if, if it's sort of relevant to a project and can perhaps come and, and study the bats at your roost. Uh, you can also uh, participate a little bit more by counting the bats. There's, there's guidance on here of how to do a bat count, when to do it. Uh, you can count the bats and add that to your report as well and you can sort of keep doing that year after year and there's a few people that do that. Um, yeah, so I'd really encourage this. Also, if you put up a bat house, you can report the bat house on here, even if there are no bats, and you can then go back and update it in the future if, if bats do use it. Um, and finally, uh, yeah, let's switch to the slides. Uh, I wanted to talk about acoustics. And so those are those uh, bat houses and bat watch are they're excellent things to get involved in, uh, especially reporting bats on bat watch. Um, but if you want to get out and learn about bats for yourselves, um, acoustics, uh, I have to say, has never been more accessible. Uh, so in the past, if you wanted to record bats like we do and, and sort of analyze it on the computer, you'd be looking at uh, tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and it's really unbelievable how in the last 10 or 15 years that has come down uh, sort of in price and accessibility. Um, so now you, about the cheapest recorder you can get, so I think it's about 250 Canadian, it depends, you have to buy it from the US. Um, but the echo meter touch illustrated on the lower left, you can plug it into your smartphone or your tablet uh, and use the app to record bats. Um, and so in 200, 200, 200, 300 bucks is not an insignificant amount of money, although um, it is, uh, you know, if you're spending a lot of money on binoculars, it's probably a bit cheaper than that. 
Um, there's other uh, options here. Um, there's also the so the upper left is the is a heterodyne bat detector, and this is what I started with, and it, it's a really good place to start. Uh, and you can get one. Unfortunately, nowhere in Canada sells them, but you can order them from uh, the Natural History Bookstore in the UK, and it works out about $130 once you get it here. Uh, and the, you can't record with these, but you can listen with bats live, and you can certainly um, uh, you can certainly go a fair ways in terms of of telling different species apart purely based on this and by tuning to the different frequencies. Um, and so, you know, if, if anyone's, uh, yeah, I'll kind of, I'll leave it there on this slide, but if anyone is interested in, in getting or, you know, in um, exploring the acoustics of bats, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I'm always happy to provide advice on that. Um, I don't have any affiliation to any of these manufacturers, I, I just, uh, but I, I do enjoy talking about them all. Uh, so you can always follow up with me on that. Uh, and the, the final point I'll add there is um, if, if, you, if you go that route or if you want to learn more about bats, uh, it's okay to to plug, to plug my book. Uh, so I did write an updated field guide for bats of Ontario uh, back in 2016 now. Um, it has uh, sort of physical, it has a bit of general information about bats. It has physical descriptions uh, as you would expect in a field guide. It has excellent life, I mean, uh, incredible life-size illustrations by uh, Fiona Reed, who also wrote and illustrated the uh, Peterson Guide to Mammals in North America. Um, and it also, I don't have a shot of the page here, but it also, uh, had, I took a particular point of including spectrograms and including details on how to identify them acoustically uh, because that is, is information that is not always easy to find and it certainly won't uh, make you an expert in acoustic identification but it's at least a place to start. Uh, so with that I, I've talked a little bit longer than I planned to for which I apologize um, but I'm more than happy to stick around and take questions if anyone has any. Oh and I just see that there are a bunch in the Q&A so um, perhaps I should just work through those. Um, yeah, cool. Okay, cool. So uh, it's sort of the, the weird thing where I have absolutely no feedback to tell where to where, tell where everyone is at. But um, I guess I will just uh, jump into answering some uh, some of these questions, assuming that you're all still out there. Just bear with me a second. Um, okay, so I'm just going to work through the questions unless I hear otherwise. Um, so uh, first up, uh, Glenn Welburn, last April saw a bat hunting in uh, an inlet uh, near Prince's Point, uh, high noon. Uh, could it have had rabies? Um, yeah, so... You raise a good point about rabies, um, and so and I, I touched on this already. But bats do carry rabies, and I just give the usual warning that you should always avoid. Be, uh, you should always avoid handling bats. Um, turn, turn now, um, yeah, you should always avoid handling bats. Uh, if uh, if you encounter a bat um, that's on the ground, you should try and call a wildlife rescue to come get it. I guess the very worst case scenario, you could use a towel or thick gloves and. Uh, put it in a box, but don't handle it directly. Uh, if there's any question of someone being bitten or scratched by a bat, you should uh, seek immediate medical treatment. Uh, rabies is very rare, um, but it's it's also uh, it's very rare. It's very treatable if you seek treatment. Uh, it is also um, you know very dangerous if you don't, and it would be terrible PR for bats to die of rabies. So it would be the worst thing you could do for bat conservation. Um, in terms of whether th this bat sort of seen flying in the day was rabid, uh, I mean, rabies does cause animals to do strange things, so it's, it's always possible. Uh, but I'd say it's not, not uh, by no means a given. Um, uh, yeah, so there are other reasons a bat could be flying around during the daytime. It could have been disturbed. Um, if it was roosting in a house, it could have you know, been disturbed and then had to leave or, or, or other factors. So um hard, hard to explain or hard to hard to guess sort of what would cause that but um it could be a combination of, or it could be a few different things um but yes but also just be very you know cautious about rabies in, in these animals um okay uh is the so uh from uh margaret dent so is the claw equivalent to a human thumb uh, and yes absolutely so um yeah so most bats uh all the bats in ontario um, all, all the microbats, so everything except the flying foxes has one, have one claw that's on the thumb, uh, and that is exactly the, uh, the same bones that we have in our, our human thumb. 
uh, and it, it sort of serves to allow the bats to sometimes manipulate things that they're eating, uh, but also to help them climb around and uh, you know, sort of cl uh, cling on to things. Uh, the mega bats, which is the flying foxes, they actually have two claws. So they have a claw on the thumb and they have an extra claw on their first finger uh, for, for whatever reason. Uh, okay, from Brit, uh, why do so many people think bats are blind? Where did that myth come from? Uh, that's a great question and I don't have a definitive answer. Uh, I would assume a part of it is that uh, is associated with um, the fact that they're active at night and in the dark um, and, it's, and vision perhaps not being key to them. Uh, a lot of bats, they have quite good vision, but they have very small eyes. Um, in fact, there are some bats where they have, some bats have really you know, big, crazy structures for their ears that come right around their face. So there's some bats where their eyes are basically in their ears, sort of surrounded by the pinea. And uh, um, you can barely see them, so it, it could just be the kind of combination of factors there, and then um, myth and legend takes care of the rest. Um, uh, yep, uh, so another question from Britt, the flying fox is actually bats, uh, but they're a close relative, and no, they, they, are, um, they are classified as bats. Uh, the family tree there, I, it, always, it changes around, um, the kind of taxon taxonomists keep arguing about it. Um, um, not so, I mean, the bat, flying foxes are always included in bats. It's more how we divide up the other groups of bats. So there's, um, uh, in terms of the echolocating species, there's this kind of two distinct groups there. And there's the question of whether they, just, they evolved echolocation uh, independently or whether they had a common ancestor that echolocated and just went in different directions. And I must admit, I'm not uh, on top of which, of what the current thinking is for how that works. Uh, but yeah, flying foxes, definitely bats. And they have, they, have the feature of true powered flight they can go right, sort of in all dimensions. Um, question from Glenn Wellburn, is it true that some moths can jam the bat's echolocation thereby escaping? Uh, yep, that's absolutely true, uh, tiger moths. Um, yep, so the, uh, I think we're still, there's been some really neat work on that in recent years trying to, to elucidate the mechanism there, but yeah, they produce this sort of rapid, uh, sort of quick fire, um, uh, sort of shotgun of sound that seems to disrupt the bat's um, echolocation and I think it has been shown that it is disrupting their echolocation rather than just a signal that the bats then associate with a, a moth that doesn't taste very good. Uh, there's also, um, so that's pretty neat, there, there are other moths which uh, similarly have evolved uh, mechanisms, so the, the uh, noctuid moths, uh, Eridlina moths that have all evolved ears, um, or maybe not all of them, but they've evolved ears so they can hear bats coming uh, and then they, uh, most of them, um, uh, have a less exciting mechanism where they just drop out of the sky to avoid the bat. So if um, they have a very crude ear, so if they have a sort of detect a distant bat, uh, then it triggers sort of low level threshold uh, and the, bat, the moth just moves away. And if the bat is close by, it triggers a high level threshold and the moth just spirals out of the air to the ground, uh, hopefully escaping. A uh, question from Milana Williams. Are there any known studies looking at ways to uh, release a retrovirus, similar gene editing to help improve survival rates against white nose fungus? Um, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of work done uh, on addressing white nose. I don't think that uh, either of those particular mechanisms have been explored, but um, so there's, there's certainly bacteria that uh, can fight the fungus if, if applied to bats. There's, uh, you can use ultraviolet light. Uh, I think there's a, a probiotic uh, that's been developed. Um, but as I, say, as I said in that, that slide, the, the biggest problem there is how, we, uh, how would we apply that to the wild populations when we now have a disease that covers uh, half of the North American continent. Uh, and presumably if we missed one cave, it, it could potentially come back. So, um, yeah, so, and then the, the, the risk of sort of doing more harm than good. So I don't think necessarily those particular mechanisms, but it, it is a very active area of research and certainly still gaining a lot of attention. Um, okay, question from uh, Debbie and Dennis. What is the recommended height for a bat house? Uh, we generally say about 15 feet off the ground. Um, so as I say, there, there is sort of a lot of good guidance for this in our, um, uh, in our uh, bat conservation PDF, which is on our webpage. Um, but uh, yeah, so about 15 feet. Uh, generally, uh, the best place to put it is on a pole. So if you can put a, a pole in the ground and put a bat house on that, south facing. Um, that's, that's generally what we suggest. Um, putting it on a building is a good second option if it's on a clear wall. Putting it on a tree is generally less preferable because um, it's more likely to get shaded out by leaves and branches and so um, and perhaps make it less, less, uh, 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 yeah, less optimal for the bats. 
Uh, a question from Lydia. What is the best question to best action to take if you have a bat roosting inside your house? Uh, I suppose the, the first question there is uh, how much of a problem it presents. I mean, I, I live in an apartment, but if I lived in a house, I'd certainly be delighted to have bats there. Uh, and if you're happy to tolerate, uh, tolerate the bats, uh, and they're not causing a particular problem, then the best action would be to uh, go to batwatch.ca and report it there. Um, if you are having problems with bats, um, uh, ultimately, it, it, you know, the, the ultimate solution there is to try and exclude them from the building. Uh, I would suggest if you can, trying to get professional advice for that and trying to find a, a pest control operator that is experienced with bats and also is uh, willing, capable to deal with them ethically. Um, you don't want to go and try and kill all the bats, so that would certainly be a terrible outcome. Uh, generally, exclusion is something that has to happen at the end of the season because you can't do it when they're in, uh, in June and July when they have babies. Uh, but yeah, it's sort of done at the end of the season by putting on one-way doors and sealing up, uh, sealing up their entrance. But it, it is quite difficult to do, and that, that's kind of why it's good to get a professional. Uh, but if you're somewhere in the middle where you, you're prepared to tolerate them, but there there are issues, you, you can do things like if if you have bats say roosting above your patio and they're leaving droppings everywhere, you can put um, uh, like a board underneath the roost to catch catch a bunch of that and, and stop it dropping down. Um, uh, yeah, you can kind of seek other adaptations like that to try and uh, you know, try and live with them comfortably and, and uh, sort of, uh, you know, kind of uh, mutually beneficial. Um, okay, question from Britt: Do I have any recommended readings for bat enthusiasts? That's a good question. I've not. Uh, I don't think I've really been asked that one before. I, obviously, I, I do like to recommend my my own book. Um, is a, a nice place to start for bats in Ontario. Uh, bats in Ontario. Uh, if you want to learn, uh, get in more depth about bats in the region, um, I guess the Peterson Guide to Mammals is, is pretty good. Uh, there's the um, uh, Bats of the Great Lakes, I think, by Alan Curter. Um, sorry, not it's not bats, it's Mammals of the Great Lakes by Alan Curter, but uh, Curter is a bat guy, so there's, there's good bat coverage in that book. Um, if you want to go more general in, in terms of background reading on bats, um, then uh, there's a lot of uh, general books by, by Brock Fenton um, that are pretty good introductions. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of stuff that immediately comes to mind. Um, yeah, that's a good question, though. I've not really been asked that one before. Um, okay, uh, another question from Debbie and Dennis. Does light pollution affect bat survival? Um, that's a complicated one. It certainly affects bat activity. Uh, and so we, we know that street lighting and, and urban lighting and things like that uh, certainly have an impact on bats. Um, sometimes you sort of see bats reported uh, foraging around, uh, around street lights. Um, it can be quite good because the light attracts insects. It kind of makes it a buffet for the bats. Um, the trade-off to that is that a lot of bats do avoid, uh, avoid light as well. They, if there's a, lit, a brightly lit roadway, they won't cross it. If, um, uh, yeah, they won't, they won't use brightly lit spaces. Um, the harder part of that is then, is then how we discern whether that affects their survival. And it's much harder to understand the population and, uh, level impacts. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just going to answer that one with probably, uh, it certainly affects them harder to pick out the survival. Um, okay. And then I think one, oh, no, still more questions. Um, uh, so another question, Debbie Dennis, uh, how do bats in our region help agriculture? Um, I have to say, I mean, probably not to a huge degree. Uh, so there is, um, there's a, a paper which is cited a lot, uh, by Boyle and all, um, uh, which talks about bats having a, I think a $3.4 billion contribution to agriculture in the U S. Um, and that's pretty neat. The, the problem with it is that they're kind of extra, they extrapolate a lot. So in southern, in the south, southern U.S., where you have um, Mexican free tail bats in uh, millions of, if you've seen the video of the bat cave in Texas, where there's millions of bats that fly out, or from a bridge in Texas as well, those bats have a, a real discernible impact on agriculture in that region because there are millions of them and they eat millions of insects. Um, bats in Ontario, although they, you know, there's more around than most people think they're, they're still pretty small numbers and I, th I still think it's hard to make the case that they're really having a sizable impact here um <clears throat> they probably provide some degree of pest control uh you know eating um, moths and beetles and things like that 
Um, but whether you know it's an amount that you could really ma uh, measure and put a number on, uh, I think is, is a bit more challenging. And it, it's one of the more, this is a sort of challenging topic in conservation because we, we kind of feel a need to, to sell uh, the value of the animals that we're trying to conserve. Um, but uh, personally, I, I get sort of uncomfortable with, with these extrapolations and, um, uh, yeah, and sort of trying to, you know, overstate the impact. They're, they're an important part of the ecosystem, um, but I don't think we can sort of put, you know, a, a figure of millions of dollars on bats in Ontario. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for the, the kind comments. I'll just see if there's any more questions. Um, okay. So a question from Anne or uh, Bob, I'm sure. Um, but to what degree do bats displace birds in ecosystems? Uh, that's a neat question. I would say probably very little uh, in that they're filling different ecological niches. Um, there aren't many birds that are active at night and the ones that are, are, tip, are typically aren't uh, feeding on the same things that bats are. So they probably exist fairly, fairly, uh, fairly well in harmony there. Um, anonymous question, do you have any tips on which side of a house to position a, a roost uh, building, building materials to avoid using? Uh, yeah, so generally we advise south facing, uh, maybe east or west, but somewhere where it's going to get a decent amount of sunlight and be fairly warm during the day. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the current uh, prevailing wisdom there. Uh, in terms of building materials to avoid using, um, so generally people build bat houses out of wood. Uh, I would avoid any uh, any sort of, um, uh, I think sort of uh, wood treated with sort of strong preservative chemicals. Uh, we tend to, I think pressure treated wood can be okay, or maybe you have to leave that for a while, uh, or maybe it's not, I, I can't actually remember that one, I'm afraid. Uh, but we, uh, whatever we buy, we, we stain it with uh, water-based stain, seems to be the best one there um, uh, for, for you know, we stain them in a dark color. Uh, and what you will see is if you're, if you're looking at bat house designs or you're shopping for them is sometimes you see bat houses with uh, sort of plastic mesh up the back to provide a surface for the bats to grip. Um, the kind of best thing to do there is to cut uh, slots uh, so sort of every you know every centimeter or so and just do uh, but that's a lot of work to cut those and it kind of needs a table saw or a specialized tools uh, so some bat houses use plastic mesh I would avoid plastic mesh um, it's, it's sort of got the potential to come loose or be chewed um, and then the bats get entangled in it and then they get stuck there and die which is the opposite of what you're trying to achieve um, so it would be wary of any any designs that include that um, okay uh, a question from Emma. Bat house has been up for a year with no luck. Uh, give me a suggestion. Um, uh, okay, and bats in uh, Mickey Sue Park. Excellent. Uh, so in terms of bat house with no bats using it, um, uh, yeah, I mean, aside from the things I've said already, sort of putting it up high, about 15 feet, putting it in, in sunlight, south facing. If it's been in a spot and it's not been working um, and bats definitely aren't using it, you can just take it down and try it in a different spot. Sometimes um, you know, sometimes that can do the trick. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that the bats don't read the books and so they don't know all the advice we're giving out and what they're supposed to be doing. Um, but you know, sometimes it, even though you put it in the perfect spot, it doesn't work, you move it somewhere else that might work there. Um, Okay, uh, a question from uh, Jackson. What can you speak to with regards to the construction of a hibernaculum? Uh, a friend has a large property near the escarpment, wants to build something to help bats over winter. Uh, well, that is that's an excellent question and idea. Yeah, that's a tricky one to answer. Uh, yeah, um, so to my knowledge, there has not been a whole lot done with artificial hibernacula in, uh, in North America, really. I think there's a, probably a few examples, uh, but there hasn't been much done. Um, I am familiar with a few in the UK uh, that, that do work, but it's a pretty different situation there. Um, I would, yeah, I mean, it, say, I mean, if, if it's pretty one, if, if you wanna send me an email afterwards or something with, with a question here, uh, or with this question, I'm happy to chat about it in more depth. Um, it's worth a Google to see if you can find sort of artificial hibernacula, but it, um, the problem is that I don't think many have been done and therefore there isn't a sort of good basis for, for giving advice on. Um, so it's, uh, it's a neat idea, but it, it certainly would be, you know, it's part of the reason that there aren't many is that it's a lot of work to then find out that it doesn't work if, it, if that's the case. So um, it's kind of a, a very challenging experiment. And so, yeah, I don't have a great answer, I'm afraid. Um, 
uh, a comment would be interesting to see bat skulls. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. You can certainly again. I apologise. I don't have a bat skeleton picture in this talk, but you, you can Google those up. Um, yeah, again, sort of pretty thin and lightweight and that sort of thing. Um, uh, okay, question from Sherry. You could comment on how to get them out of your house safely. Uh, had to do that before. Uh, learn how to do it safely instead of hitting and killing them. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's a great point. Um, and certainly. Uh, yeah, sort of one thing to talk about having bats roosting in your attic if they're or in your wall and they're, they're not doing any harm. But if you have bat come into your living space, that, that's not really a situation that anyone wants or a situation that the bat wants. Um, yes, yeah, so if you have a bat come into your living space, um, it, you know, the immediate thing is you want to you want to get the bat out. Um, if you can open the windows and doors and then encourage it to fly out, um, that's probably the best solution all around. Um, if it's nighttime, then uh, having the lights on and the doors and windows open is very good. Putting the bat out, if you sort of let it fly out in the day, it's a little bit more vulnerable to predation, but it's, it's probably still the best option for the bat. Um, if you really can't, uh, if, if the bat really can't fly out or it, it won't to, it can't find its way out, um, then yeah, using a towel or thick gloves to, to sort of safely capture it. Um, uh, but so safely for you and the bat and get it into a box and then contact a white you well if it's summertime and the bat seems all right you can give it a bit of water and let it go in the evening otherwise generally the best thing to do is contact a wildlife rescue if, if you have one locally i uh, i know uh, there's the toronto wildlife center which is pretty good for bats i don't know if there's a, a, um, a specific uh, wildlife rescue for for hamilton i'm afraid um but yeah, uh, getting it out. But the key thing is, is avoiding getting uh, bitten or, or that contact with the bat yourself. Um, and then the, the second thing being trying to avoid harm to the bat. But yeah, if you can kind of get, you know, if, it's like, if the bat is on the ground and you know, tossing a towel over it or something, you can kind of wrap it up in there and take it outside without getting bitten. Um, uh, yeah, question from Emma, is it okay to use chicken wire inside the bat uh, for, for bats to grip? Um, I'd say chicken wire is probably a bit, big, um, I'd go for maybe a smaller mesh. Uh, actually, in some of the bat houses that we've made at the zoo, we use, uh, I think it's a quarter inch mesh and we staple it down quite firmly. And I think that's probably okay. I don't think the bats are gonna be chewing through the metal there. Um, so yeah, maybe like a finer mesh like that and make sure it's very firmly, firmly stuck down. Um, question from Tonya, uh, have you experienced any issues with house cats and bat relationships in developed areas? Um, so, uh, I mean, directly, I, I don't have experience of this, but uh, yeah, house cats are certainly an issue with, with bats. Um, I mean, in urban areas and probably in rural areas as well. Um, frankly, for intemperate countries, house cat is probably the main predator of bats, either that or of owls. Um, one of the advantages for bats of flying at night is that they don't have a lot of predators. Um, there is you know, nothing that can eat them. Uh, but yeah, cats can certainly be an issue um, and cats are pretty smart. And if, you know, if a cat finds a bat roost in a house and it can get to it, you know, learns to sit outside every night and sort of catch every bat that comes out, it, it can cause quite a problem. Um, yeah, and then with the, the feral cat populations that we have as well. Um, but yeah, so I know, I know that, uh, um, yeah, cats is kind of a, a, a sensitive subject um, in the wildlife community but i mean it is, you know to my mind it makes the case for having indoor cats and uh, sort of not allowing the cats the opportunity to um uh, sort of be unnatural predators to to our bats um okay a uh, question for ken uh, how do bats deal with captivity at the zoo uh, that's a good one um so we uh, so we have one species of bat currently in the collection at the toronto zoo so um and to be to be clear my um uh, I guess my work and the, the conservation programs that we have are more about working with animals sort of out in the wild and in our backyard. Uh, so I don't, I don't have a lot to do with the bats on site, uh, which are um, African straw colored bats. So they're a species of flying fox, uh, a fruit bat, uh, which obviously is not native to Ontario. Uh, but they seem to do pretty well in captivity. Uh, they, um, yeah, they, if you, if you ever visit the zoo, they're, they're in the caves under, under the Africa Pavilion. And uh, yeah, they like they like they're climbing around and finding their fruit and uh, the odd bit of flying in there, and they seem to be pretty happy. Uh, we don't have any insectivorous bats or any Ontario bats. It's something we 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 have looked at in the past. Um, insectivorous bats seem to be a lot more difficult to deal with uh, and to sort of 
um, so yeah, sort of maintain with strong welfare in um, in captivity. Uh, so um, yeah, certainly yes, species vary a lot in terms of how well they they do in captivity and how sort of effective that is all around. Um, and so insectivorous bats are a lot more challenging than uh, the frugivorous bats. It's not something that we've tried to date and we've kind of looked at it in the past and sort of uh, not taken it forwards. Um, uh, but that we do have, um, although we only have one species in the collection, we do have, uh, we, have well, we have recorded seven of the eight Ontario species flying around the zoo. So we do have plenty of wild bats uh, around as well. Um, and in, uh, in normal years uh, where we can, we can have a host events and have people come visit. Um, uh, we, we normally do bat walks at the zoo. We have a uh, big bat night in normally in the middle of August uh, where we, we have uh, yeah, talks about bats and then go walk around the site listening to the bats that we have. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, and that works pretty well. Um, okay, yeah, and then a question at the bottom. Oh, it's the same, same from Kren. Uh, are they able to, uh, to breed in captivity? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that our fruit bats, uh, yeah, our fruit bats do breed in captivity, um, the, the ones that we have at the zoo right now. Um, yeah, normally the, the males are kept separately from the females and then I think they get a few times a year, they get to uh, spend time together there. Um, and uh, yeah, so as I say, keeping insectivorous bats in, in captivity is a bit more challenging. Um, but uh, there is a, a research colony um, at the uh, McMaster University that's, that's managed by uh, Dr. Paul Four, who runs a research lab there. Um, and he's actually been doing some, some really neat stuff where they've maintained this, this uh, research colony of big brown bats for a long time now. Um, uh, but in, in the past few years, he's kind of managed to, to dial it in and get it to the point where he's actually getting those bats, um, we're seeing those bats breeding in captivity. Uh, I think in the past they've had uh, they've sort of captured females that were pregnant and they've given birth in captivity, so they've had captive foreign bats. Um, but now, uh, now they're starting to actually um, mate in that in that colony as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty neat. Um, so uh, that takes me to the bottom of the the questions list. Um, if uh, yeah, um, it, it also reminds me there's two other things I wanted to mention very quickly. If if uh, if, uh, if you're still there. Um, one is I, I really I did I did this talk a couple of weeks ago and uh, I made the same mistake that I've done it tonight uh, is I forgot to mention uh, sort of the relationship between bats and coronavirus um, which I probably should address in the, the current times obviously you've almost certainly heard um, bats being named as a sort of source for, for the current coronavirus that's turned our world upside down um, and I don't want to speak about it in, in great depth because there's, there's some good information out there already available about that. But um, I think just a key thing to mention here is that um, uh, well, I don't think we, we haven't fully established where you know the, the origins of the, of the coronavirus that's causing the current pandemic. Um, bats may well play a role in its history. Uh, it's also uh, likely involves other species, and it, it may have existed in bats some time ago. I think the virus, the, the coronavirus that caused the SARS epidemic a, a few years ago now, um, that, spent, that virus came from bats, but it, it was uh, in bats 50 years before it reached humans. So there was a, you know, an extended step in between. Um, but it, sort of when it comes to questions about bats and coronavirus and, and the current pandemic, the, the really key thing here is, um, it, you know, is to remember that this is ultimately it's a human pandemic it's a human disease it is traveling between humans um and so um yeah and, and it, you know pointing the finger at particular parts of wildlife it is not not uh, uh not a productive way forward there it's more about understanding and, and uh more effectively managing our relationship with with wild animals and with nature uh, and sort of the overlap there uh, and the final thing I just wanted to throw in quickly uh, that I almost forgot, uh, but I, I was asked to mention. So uh, if any of you do have a bat house, uh, there is a, a researcher. She, she's just finishing up her PhD in Trent, but she's going to be moving to, uh, to Waterloo and, and working with Wildlife Conservation Society. Uh, but there's a researcher, Karen Vanderwolf, who is um, looking to do some more in-depth studies into bat houses and understanding how effective, you know, what makes an effective bat house and what makes them work well for bats. Um, and so if you have a, a bat house, she would be really interested uh, to hear from you. And there's an online survey that she's looking for people to fill out uh, to get information about their bat houses. And she's also looking for people who are willing for her to install a small data logger to record the temperature uh, in bat houses. Um, 
to learn about them that way. So um, perhaps what I can do, it, there isn't a sort of easy web link for that, but perhaps I can uh, email uh, Lou with a, a link to uh, Karen's uh, survey and information there. And if anyone has a bat house and is, is willing to help her out with that, you can get in touch with her directly. Um, so uh, aside from that, I guess uh, I, I will uh, I'll finish talking now, but thank you all so much. I, I really appreciate all the questions. Um, as you probably figured out by now, I really enjoy talking about bats. Um, so hopefully that's kind of, uh, yeah, it's given you some good information. Um, my email was on the screen there, uh, but you can contact us at uh, bats at uh, tronozoo.ca or .com, I always get it wrong, no, .ca. Uh, or you can get in touch with me other ways um, if you want advice on uh, getting into bat acoustics or anything else. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it there, thank you.